Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National World War II Museum's evening presentation webinar. My name is Jeremy Collins, and for those of you watching on Zoom, uh, some brief housekeeping remarks. You are a, um, an attendee of our Zoom event tonight. That means you do not have video or audio privileges, but you can interact with our moderator and guest by writing your question in the Q&A box. The moderator will be reviewing those during the question and answer session, which will conclude tonight's program. And now to introduce the moderator, it's my pleasure to pass this program over to Dr. Rob Satino. Rob? Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, Dr. Rob Satino here, the senior historian at the National World War II Museum in beautiful New Orleans, Louisiana. We have a really special guest with us tonight, uh, uh, a friend of the museum, uh, my friend, and a uh, uh, a wonderful writer and author, Ian Toll. Ian, welcome. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Ian uh, probably is one of those people who, you know, doesn't really need an uh, introduction, as we like to say. And you all know what that means. The introduction should be really long. Ian's an extremely accomplished uh, uh, scholar and uh, writer. He's the author of Six Frigates, the Epic History of the Founding of the U.S. Navy, as well as a trilogy called The Pacific War, the third volume of which has just been released. Uh, called Twilight of the Gods, War in the Western Pacific, 1944-1945. Uh, he's won the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award from the Naval Order of the United States. Uh, he's won the William E. Colby Military Writers Award. He's won the other Samuel Elliott Morrison Award uh, uh, that is given by the USS Constitution Museum. Uh, I've been kidding you, Ian. Uh, if there's any more Samuel Elliott Morrison awards out there, I fully expect you to, to see you winning one in the not too distant future. But uh, thanks so much for agreeing to spend some time with us and, and talking with us about Twilight of the Gods tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure and my honor. You know, what I'm struck by the book, uh, Ian, uh, I'm always struck by what an, how an author chooses to open the story. This is a, it's a big story, war in the Western Pacific, 44, 45, some of the biggest naval battles of all time jam-packed with action and valor and heroism of every sort. But you know, you begin this book in an interesting way in the, in the realm of, of politics. And I thought it was really nicely done. You look especially at FDR and at, uh, at Douglas MacArthur. Why open the book uh, that way? And I'll ask, it, I'll, I'll even expand on my question. It's a bit of a risk. You have to know that a lot of people are opening up an Ian Toll book because they want to get to Leyte Gulf. Yep. So what, why, open the, why open it with the sort of survey of the U.S. political scene at the time? Right, military history, it's, there's an expectation that there's going to be lead in the air, uh, at least by the second chapter. And, you know, in this case, you really have to wait until the third, almost 100 pages into the book. And, um, you know, it, it is an unconventional way to begin a work of military history. I think uh, my thought was I had a little bit of latitude in this case because it's the third uh, volume of a trilogy. And a lot of the people who are reading it have already read the first two, so they're they're either committed to read it or not. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, basically my observation was looking at the Pacific War uh, was that there was a, a lot of literature about FDR, a lot about MacArthur. You know, I like to say there's a pickup truck uh, full of FDR biographies, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. There's a large wheelbarrow full of, FD, of uh, MacArthur biographies. I mean, these are two of the most fascinating figures in, in 20th century American history. And biographers uh, are, love them for obvious reasons. So these, the story of the Pacific uh, Command Conference, which took place in Oahu, in the island of Oahu in Hawaii, in July 1944, that story has just been told over and over and over again because of how frequently new biographies are coming out of both FDR and MacArthur. And of course, that's a featured um, uh, incident in any biography of either of those two because it was a dramatic meeting that took place, first time they had met in seven years. Uh, and two of, as I said, two of the most colorful uh, figures in, of that period of American history. <clears throat> For that reason, and I think this actually started during the war in the way that the press covered this event, um, we have tended to uh, look at that meeting through the prism of American politics. Immediately before leaving on his trip that took him to Hawaii, uh, FDR had announced to nobody's surprise that he was going to run for an unprecedented fourth term of office as president. Uh, and, uh, and then had visited the Democratic National Convention on his way out to the West Coast. 
So the way the press uh, observed, essentially the way the country saw this trip to, to Hawaii was that it was a campaign stop. It was a publicity event. Uh, in fact, it was much more than that. It was a very substantive command conference and FDR was doing something which I think we would have expected any commander in chief to do, which is to visit the Pacific theater. It's the only time he did it. Uh, and for the millions of, of men and women who were fighting under our flag in the Pacific, that visit told them that they had not been forgotten, and I think that was important. So, um, uh, you know, why begin it with that, uh, that long account of, of the press and of that visit? I think that it was important to try to unite uh, what had become these two, you know, very separate kind of strands in the literature of, of this, this uh, biographical or political uh, kind of a view of this meeting between MacArthur and FDR and what was a very substantive and historically important military planning conference that involved uh, FDR, MacArthur, also Nimitz, and also uh, Admiral Leahy, who's almost always forgotten, but this was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a very low profile figure who was immensely important in, uh, in this period of American history. Wrote some of the greatest memoirs of the Pacific War and the Roosevelt presidency as well, yes, Leahy. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So um, let, we'll get to the, str the, the strategic talk at that Oahu conference, but, but before we uh, sort of get, move away from the, the politics, tell us about MacArthur in 1944. There was a move to make him president, was there? How badly did he want to? How badly did he want to get into the Oval Office in 1944? Well, yeah, MacArthur, um, you know, flirted with the presidency many times throughout his career. Actually, beginning in the 1920s, uh, he had been, you know, his name had been sort of floated in Republican circles. Um, and as you say, in 1944, uh, he allowed uh, his supporters in the states, these were powerful members of Congress in the Republican Party, uh, certain conservative uh, media owners, and uh, various other uh, figures on the American right, who saw uh, MacArthur as potentially their only chance to defeat FDR in a, in a wartime election. And so uh, they essentially sort of started this dark horse campaign with MacArthur's uh, implicit connivance. Um, and, uh, and it didn't lead anywhere. And, and the reasons for that is be essentially because the governor of New York, Tom Dewey, locked up the nomination early in the primary process. Um, but yes, it's been, it, the question has been asked and historians and biographers have debated, did MacArthur actually want to run for president and, and would he have liked to become president? Uh, or was this just a way of exerting pressure on the president and on the Joint Chiefs to do what he wanted to do in the Pacific, which essentially involved um, sending more military assets to MacArthur's command. The Pacific was divided, as you know. Uh, the northern half was essentially under the control of the Navy. Chester Nimitz was the theater commander. And then in the Southwest Pacific, you had MacArthur. This division of the Pacific into two auton semi-autonomous uh, theater commands was very controversial and was re regarded as essentially a way of settling this, this rivalry between the Army and the Navy, satisfying MacArthur, but leaving the Navy in charge of, of the Naval War. Um, and, um, and so, you know, the, this, this question of, you know, would MacArthur eventually gain supreme command in the Pacific, which was his goal? And then secondly, could he ensure that our route back to Tokyo went through the Philippines and that he would get the green light to liberate the Philippines, including critically the northern island of Luzon. And so these were his goals. And this, uh, this kind of dark horse campaign for president may simply have been a way of exerting pressure in order to, to fulfill those goals. How about FDR? You, you write marvelously early on in the book that, that the war had changed him. This yes. was a kind of happy warrior type. His press conferences used to be ones for the ages earlier in his in his presidency. He'd be joshing with the reporters. He knew whose birthday it was, whose children. We're having a birthday that day, making jokes back and forth. It's not really FDR, but by this point of the war, is it? No, FDR, you know, is, of course, this was the longest presidency in American history. And often, uh, and I remember at the outset of our current president's administration, there was a story, I believe it, might, I believe it was in the Washington Post, but it was about uh, FDR's relationship with the press. And it was about how clever he was at essentially using the sort of charm tactics that he was famous for uh, to get the press on his side. And, um, and uh, you know, that's an accurate depiction of how FDR dealt with the press in his first term in office. By his third term, 1941, uh, he had essentially had it with the press. Uh, he, he really was 
deeply offended, I think, in general at the way the press was covering politics. A number of his bitterest enemies were uh, major media uh, owners. And, um, and his, uh, his twice weekly press conferences were uh, pretty cantankerous. And uh, he really had, and he was actually out on the campaign trail attacking the press um, uh, constantly. And so uh, I thought that was an important part of the perspective. And I, I wanted to get into the way the different military services also developed their publicity um, uh, policies, how the Army and the Navy and MacArthur and Nimitz had their different approaches to this. And I thought that that was just an important way to kind of introduce this, the, the larger dimension of what was happening in the Pacific and the kinds of the, the environment in which military leaders had to make their decisions and do their jobs during this bloody war. So you, you mentioned, again, at the Oahu conference, uh, the big strategic decisions have to be made. Yes. I, I guess the way you write it, as I was reading your, uh, your chapter on it, we'd, we'd come to a fork in the road, hadn't we? Um, th th there was a big decision that had to be made, and I, I guess you could break it down and say simply Luzon versus Formosa. Can you break that down a little bit for our for the participants there? Yeah, to make, to make a long story short, uh, there were, you know, by June 1944, certainly July 1944, we had taken the Mariana Islands, uh, we had taken Saipan, we were about to take Guam. Uh, that gave us islands that were within bombing distance of the Japanese industrial heartland in Tokyo with the new B-29 bomber. Um, the Japanese striking arm of the Japanese fleet had been annihilated in the, in the accompanying naval battle that took place during that campaign. So essentially the Japanese were, were finished in terms of, of any hopes they might have had of winning this war, uh, those were gone. And so this last stage of the war was, you know, how do you force the Japanese to capitulate? And, and you know, it was gonna be unconditional surrender. That was our policy. I believe it was the right policy to say that we were gonna occupy and disarm Japan, supervise uh, the reconstruction of a democratic Japan. And of course, the Japanese regime was very far away from that. So the question became in the last year, how do you force them to surrender? MacArthur um, really had the Philippines as the centerpiece of, of his conception. Uh, many said he wanted to liberate the Philippines more even than winning the war. Uh, and the Navy uh, and many of the uh, powerful uh, internal planners of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Organization in Washington saw a, a major role for China in this last stage of the Pacific campaign. So they wanted a foothold on the coast of China. They wanted that for bases for the B-29s. They also wanted the potential to draw upon Chinese infantry manpower in the invasion of Japan, if that were to take place in the destruction of Japanese armies on the Asian mainland. And so that pointed to Formosa. So by, by mid-1944, I think it's fair to say that uh, we were going to take one of those two islands first, either Luzon, the northern island of the Philippines, where the, where the capital city of Manila is, or Formosa, today we call it Taiwan, one of these two islands. And, uh, and that was the immediate decision that FDR and his military chiefs faced in uh, mid-1944. Beyond that, there was the question of, uh, can we force the Japanese to surrender without actually invading their homeland? And, uh, and that, that played very much into the thinking that, uh, that they were confronting at this time as well. Let me, um, let me uh, try to pin you down to a what if, because we love what ifs, don't we? Um, I think our, our listeners know, our viewers know that of course, Luzon was the choice. How might the Pacific War, the Asia Pacific War, I guess we should say, how might it have been different if we'd landed a big gigantic force on Formosa, turned it into a major, a, a, a base, a air base, a base for B-29s, uh, in, maybe intervened in the fighting in the mainland. Of course, there's a civil war that's about to break out at the end of this war. Yeah. I just wonder, any thoughts on that? I, I know it's big. Well, I, th I think that if we had landed in Formosa, it would be a good bet that we would still have troops there today. Um, and so uh, the nature of the conflict between today, the independent nation of Taiwan and China would be uh, that much more intense with a major American military presence there. Of course, that is somewhat speculative. It's a what if, as you say. The really interesting and, and enormous question for the world is, had we uh, taken Formosa in 1944, uh, would we then have, would that have led to a larger involvement 
of American troops on the Asian mainland, and might that have led to a different result in the Chinese Civil War? Again, it's so speculative, it's, it's very hard to make really persuasive arguments, and I'm not an expert on what happened in the Chinese Civil War. Uh, but uh, 1949, you know, four years after the end of the Second World War, Mao had taken control of China, and the significance of that event uh, for world history, including today, uh, it's just incalculable. And so it is, uh, you know, Ernest King, uh, who was the chief of naval operations, the senior leader of the officer in the Navy during the Second World War. In 1949, looking back, uh, he raised this question. If we had done what I had wanted to do, he said, to take Formosa, bypass Luzon, uh, this might have led to a different result. Perhaps uh, Mao wouldn't have gotten the upper hand in China. And of course, that really would have diverted the course of Asian and world history. The fa fascinating, that's one of the, the fascinating what ifs. The, the Pacific War is so large that almost any change you make in it changes the course of our own historical timeline, you might yes. say, dramatic changes across the board. Yeah, no, and it, I mean, it's true in Europe as well. I, I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons the Second World War is, is so unique, so important, so fascinating. Uh, it really has shaped the post-war world in, in both Asia and Europe. And, and uh, t you know, choices that were being made by uh, generals and admirals uh, in uh, how to prosecute the war, those had major downstream implications for the post-war world, implications that we're still living with today. Fascinating stuff. Let me uh, shift gears on you a little bit, Ian. Uh, so much of your book, and I would describe your book as an uh, uh, expertly written operational analysis. I, 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 it's my bread and butters to read operational history, and, and this is as, as good as it gets. Um, you know what you're talking about when you say that, so I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Um, but you know, much of what you deal with there is, is something else I, I, I think is necessary in operational history, and it's the, the personalities of the U.S. commanders. There's some unforgettable uh, folk here. Let me read you, if you don't mind, a quote from, from the book by Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher talking about carrier warfare in the Pacific. And I'd like you to comment on it after I've read it to our audience. This is Mitcher speaking. There are just so many Japanese planes on any island. We'll go in and take it on the chin. We'll swap punches with them. I know I'll have losses, but I'm stronger than they are. I don't give a damn if they do spot me. I can go anywhere and no one can stop me. If I go in and destroy all their aircraft, their damn island is no good to them anyhow. How does that stand up today in, in your eyes, Ian, as an analysis of the Pacific War of 1944, 1945? Well, it was certainly uh, an accurate statement of the capabilities of our carrier task forces by 1944. Um, you know, in the, in the first year of the war, uh, which I covered in Pacific Crucible, you had these, these uh, carrier duels where you had battles between, um, you know, small carrier task forces involving maybe three or four carriers at most, uh, in which Really, it was a question of hit and run, you know, try to attack, uh, get your planes over your enemy's fleet first, um, hide your ships in weather fronts if you can. If you're attacking an air base on an island, you know, you get in with complete surprise, you attack, you recover your planes aboard your carriers, and then you get the hell out of there before the land-based air can, can uh, counterattack right. on the fleet. By 1944, uh, the size of our carrier task force in the Pacific. So this was Task Force 58 when Spruance had it, Task Force 38 when Halsey had it. Um, you, you know, you're talking about 12 to 16 aircraft carriers, heavy Essex class carriers and light, lighter independence class carriers, but these are fleet carriers um, operating in, in semi-autonomous task groups, which are operating kind of within uh, shouting distance of each other. And I mean, they're, they're launching 1,000, 1,200 planes in a single integrated strike that is descending on, you know, the, the Japanese air base on some island in the Pacific, call it the Marianas, for example. And I mean, they're, they're just, uh, they're just uh, uh, wiping the skies clean of the Japanese defending fighters and then going in there and, and bombing the living daylights out of their air bases, destroying their planes on the ground. So. What, what Mitchell is saying there is that uh, the, the carriers had, had gotten powerful enough by this stage of the war that the hit and run approach was no longer necessary. That you could simply bring your carrier uh, task force into range of a major Japanese air base and essentially just destroy it, over, overpower it with air power. Uh, 
uh, and, uh, and confidently fight off any counterstrike on the American fleet. And so that's how carrier warfare changed in the late stages of the war. Let's, um, let's move over to, to uh, Admiral Spruance, who's always, for some reason, been one of my favorite characters, precisely because he's, a, he's not so colorful. Uh, he's more, more of the organization man. Um, every commander, he said, must be a gambler. But he wanted to be one of the professional variety. Right. That's his own quote. Now, so he, he wanted his own quote, all the odds I could get stacked in my favor. That's a little right. bit different than Mitcher's take, eh? Or, or not? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, Spruance was, um, he was a black shoe in Navy parlance, which meant that he was a surface naval warfare officer. He was not an aviator. He had never uh, skippered a carrier. Um, and, um, and he was this very sort of had this phlegmatic style. I mean, it was very much of, as you say, a, you know, an organization man is the kind of guy you could see being a CEO of a, a major company today. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a cool character, uh, cerebral, very, very smart by everybody's account, um, but uh, really didn't believe in, in the kind of blood and thunder sort of style of command. And so he's often contrasted to Bull Halsey for that reason. Um, and Spruance had, uh, you know, sort of ascended to the top seagoing command in the U.S. Navy by a, really a, a series of accidents. He had accidentally been thrust into the position of commanding one of the task forces at the Battle of Midway and was credited for winning that immortal battle. And then he had been recalled to shore duty to, as Nimitz's chief of staff. So he and Nimitz became very, very close professionally and personally. And essentially Nimitz said, I trust this guy. Uh, to take the fleet out and make the same decisions that uh, I would, if I, Nimitz would, if I was commanding at sea. Of course, Nimitz never commanded at sea during the Second World War. He was in his uh, shorebound headquarters for the entire war. So he had tapped, tapped Spruance as his guy to take the fleet to sea. Uh, Spruance by 1944, I think what he's getting at in that quote is, uh, you know, we have overwhelming naval superiority. Uh, we are going to win this war. Let's not take any unnecessary chances that may allow the enterprising Japanese to get in and kind of score uh, a, a lucky victory against us. Let's play by the numbers. And I think that that was the correct approach to take by that late stage of the war. And, um, and that certainly has generally been the judgment of historians who have uh, rated Spruance as the best of the wartime fleet commanders in the Pacific. Um, you referenced Bull Halsey, and, and in fact, a lot of this volume is about, about Bull Halsey. He's all over the action, of course, in this yeah. period of, of, of the Pacific War. Um, how would you rate him? And let me ask you that in, in two ways. Um, how about his, first, his abilities as an operational commander, and then if you could say something about his seamanship, because it, 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 the question is, it just asks itself, this is a man who led his fleet into not one but two horrible typhoons and definitely a kind of a black mark in his career. So I wonder, first of all, as, as an operational commander, how would you rate him? And then if you could say a word about some of the problems he ran into as well. Well, yeah, I mean, Halsey made a series of significant errors in the last year of the Pacific War. Um, and the, the two typhoons uh, have often been mentioned. Uh, a number of, of influential subordinates uh, the task group commanders, these were the junior admirals who served under him, uh, were harshly critical of his major decisions. And at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, he made what was perhaps one of the most infamous uh, command errors in naval history, uh, which could have led to disaster, but didn't because the Japanese commander retreated uh, at, the, at the kind of the critical moment. So, um, you know the 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 list of the indict list of indictments against uh, Bull Halsey simply uh, in terms of his management of the fleet in the last year is pretty long, and pretty damning. You know more broadly looking at Halsey, uh, he was the senior task carrier task force commander in the Pacific when the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor in 1941. He had the carriers; they were at sea. That was fortunate uh, because they weren't in port when the Japanese attacked. And so Halsey really was the carrier admiral. He was the, the uh, commander at sea who had what was left of the Navy's striking capability in the first months of the war. And that was a period in which uh, essentially our forces were, had not been ready for war and had to very quickly kind of get up to speed and learn to fight by fighting essentially. And Halsey was the leader in those critical early 
uh, months of the uh, of the of the war, and um, I think he gets a lot of credit for that. He had a colorful style, uh, you know, the blood and thunder style, which I mentioned earlier. That was Halsey's style. He he had a very foot forward approach to publicity, to talking to the forces under his command through the media, and of course, because he's talking through the media, he also ends up talking to the American people. He becomes very famous in some ways, the face of the U.S. Navy during the war. He's often, he's often compared to General Patton in, um, in, in Europe, and I think it's an apt comparison on many counts. Uh, but in the middle years of the war, he's the South Pacific theater commander, shorebound at a headquarters in New Caledonia. And so he really loses touch with the day-to-day -day kind of job of running the fleet. And when he's brought back to, to take over the fleet in, um, in 1944, it's a totally different animal that he's commanding. He hasn't really kept up. He insists on bringing his long-serving loyal staff officers who had all been in that shorebound South Pacific headquarters for two years uh, with him, you know, and they weren't up to speed. And so you had essentially a, a large organization coming in to take over the Fifth Fleet, which became the Third Fleet when Halsey had it. And, uh, and they, they weren't really ready to do that. Uh, and so they were, uh, it was, I, I think, a, a mistake that you can attribute you know, up the chain of command to Admiral King and Admiral Nimitz, maybe that was not a good choice to bring uh, Halsey back and put him into that role in 1944. Um, you write uh, beautifully about one of the most complex military actions in human history, and I've pretty much read them all, and it's the Battle of Leyte Gulf, of course. There is so much going on, and it really requires a deft touch even to make up uh, an account that the reader can follow, and you, you, you do that marvelously. You refer to the uh, Leyte Gulf battle, Ian, as, as virtually a naval bonsai charge yes, on the part of the uh, Japanese. What are the Japanese chances of, of winning, in any real sense, the Battle of Leyte Gulf? <clears throat> well, they, uh, you know, we, by that time, the Japanese were desperate, really. I mean, they were losing the war on all fronts. Uh, and essentially, they realized that their problem was is, is that if the Americans took the Philippines, uh, they would um, be cut off from their fuel supply, which was in the Dutch East Indies. So the Japanese, to back up, had, um, had launched the war in the first place primarily because they wanted their own source of oil. And the, the most productive oil fields in Asia at that point were in uh, Indonesia, Borneo, and Sumatra, what was then the East Indies. And so they wanted those, those uh, oil fields. They went and took them in the first uh, months of the war. Uh, but then they had to, to um, uh, you know, bring that oil back to Japan in, in tankers, which were vulnerable. So essentially, they foresaw you know, that critical artery of the Japanese empire was about to be cut. And once it was cut, uh, their fleet you know, might not even be able to get into position to give battle. Uh, it might be immobilized for lack of fuel. And so their decision to throw essentially their entire remaining fleet uh, against us uh, in the Battle of Leyte Gulf sprung from this, this awareness that they had that this might be their only chance to fight a, a naval battle at all, let alone win it. And, and the driving uh, uh, motive there was to just to be sure that the fleet did put up a fight, that it didn't end the war kind of swinging at anchor or, or to be destroyed by carrier planes in port. Uh, it had to go out with a bang rather than a whimper and, um, and the Japanese, given the, the significant disadvantages they had, they actually came up with a very good plan. Uh, their plan was to lure the main striking force of the, of the American carriers, the Third Fleet, away from the beachhead at Leyte uh, to allow uh, two Japanese surface fleets to get at this vulnerable amphibious fleet that lay off the beachhead. And uh, they very nearly succeeded in doing that. And, um, and it was really an extraordinary sort of series of uh, deceptions that uh, put them in position and, and the uh, significant command error, which we talked about earlier uh, by Admiral Halsey. I'm struck by a fleet and a military establishment that was so outclassed in terms of numbers and power by October 1945, and yet still manages to come close to landing a major hurt on a U.S. amphibious landing by that point in the war. You know, there's a great German, uh, a Prussian, actually, military philosopher who says, war is the domain of chance. It's the domain of fog. You're never quite sure what's going to happen. And, and I, I think Leyte Gulf, and I think you bring this home really well in your discussion of it, might be the classic example. 
So thanks. Thank you. Um, let's talk, uh, uh, if, if you don't mind for a moment, Ian, let's get out of Leyte and, and go to the Japanese home islands. You know, by now, and by now I mean late 1944, it must have been clear to every clear thinking Japanese that the war had been lost, that, that the war was all but over, that there was no real position that Japan could defend, and there was no real position that the United States could not take if it was willing to accept, uh, accept the losses. You write, for example, of a, of a Japanese economy in which there were six pr principal concrete factories in the entire country. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a matter of any time the U.S. Uh, Army Air Forces wished, they, they could destroy the Japanese concrete industry and uh, put it out of business. And they did this repeatedly in the, in the course of the war. There's almost no redundancy. What kept Japan, maybe the Japanese people, going through this incredible level of devastation? Well, I think, uh, you know, I mean, an interesting book yet to be written, maybe you could write it yourself, actually, would be to, to take the, um, the uh, Nazi Germany's propaganda techniques in terms of how they controlled information going to their own public and contrast, compare that and contrast it to what the Japanese did. In each case, I think you'll find that the Axis nations, like totalitarian countries throughout history, have, had, have, have attempted to have total control over uh, what their own public actually knows about what's happening out, outside in the, in the world beyond. So probably in no country uh, has that ever been done as thoroughly as it was done in Japan during the Second World War. The regime had total control over the Japanese media, told the newspapers exactly what to write, what to, what to tell the Japanese people about what was happening. And so the average Japanese person really had a very limited understanding of what was happening. And uh, as you say, by this late stage in the war, you start to see B-29s coming in. Uh, the uh, Japanese people were more or less immiserated, uh, ver verging on uh, starvation. Famine was a very real danger in the last year of the war. If the war had gone on for a few months longer, I think famine would have actually hit uh, Japan, ma major regions of Japan in a big way. But the Japanese people, certainly the ordinary Japanese people, did not know just how dire things were, really until the emperor came on the radio and said, it's it, this is it, we're, we're uh, thrown in the towel. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I tried to weave into this, these books, these three books, uh, an, an appreciation of what life was like, you know, for the Japanese man or woman on the street. Uh, and, and to try to present, you know, through their eyes what, what they saw with the limited information that was available to them, and just how thoroughly deceived uh, they were by this malevolent regime that took control of Japan during these years. You know, you write about the fighting in the Philippines um, in, in great detail here. And, and frankly, I came away from it I'm very glad I had not been there. The, the, the fighting in the Philippines was horrible. But it climaxed in a particularly horrific way in the battle for the capital of the Philippines, uh, Manila. You describe uh, Manila as demonstrating, I'm quoting Ian, the worst pathologies of Japan's military culture and ideology. Can you can enlighten us a bit more about what, what do you mean by that? Well, the, uh, the Japanese army in particular had essentially inculcated this idea uh, that uh, you can never surrender under any circumstances. You have to fight to the death uh, or, if necessary, take your own life rather than be captured. And um, I don't think this has generally been well understood, but this was a new and radical idea in uh, Japanese military culture. This had not been something that had come down through the samurai tradition. Um, this in the samurai era, uh, eras of, of warfare in Japan, the Japanese warrior had fought only his fellow Japanese. And, and if a battle, if he had done his duty and the battle clearly turned against him, he could lay down his arms and surrender with his honor intact. And so surrender was not anathema uh, traditionally in Japanese culture. Uh, and so uh, this was something that the, that the Japanese army really just in the period after the ja uh, Russo-Japanese War in 1905 had decided, you know, this will make us invincible if we, if we order our soldiers never to surrender. This will make us a very formidable army. Um, <clears throat> again and again in the Pacific, and Manila is probably the, maybe the single best example of it. You know, when you tell an army of um, 18, 19, 20-year-old uh, farm boys uh, 
that they are going to die no matter what, uh, that they are going to have to fight to the death, take their own lives if necessary. Uh, that 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 puts pressure on them, and, and the results, you know, can can be pretty severe. And so the sack of Manila, I think, is in part an outgrowth of this kind of uh, distortion of what the Japanese uh, military traditions and cultures were. And uh, and it was a you know it was one of the darkest chapters of the Pacific War, which is, is of course one of the darkest wars in our history. Hitler regularly claimed that horrible things he was telling the Germans to do were historic German traditions dating back four or five, six hundred years. And it, it strikes me as relatively similar, a, a kind of new radicalization of warfare being touted somehow as dating all the way back to the, to the 14 or, or, or 1300s. And I, I, I found those portions of the book extremely enlightening. Um, there's another issue, of course, that has to be dealt with in, in any book on this period. and, and you certainly write about it in um, Twilight of the Gods. Writing about this, these events 75 years later, is it possible to fathom the phenomenon of the kamikaze? Uh, by, by, by which I mean, you know, we, we, can, can we uh, who are alive today ever hope to understand what was going through the mind of a young Japanese pilot, more or less strapped in his airplane and told to hurdle himself into the first US, air, US uh, aircraft carrier he could find? Uh, we, we can certainly try, and it, it, it helps that so many of the kamikazes uh, left um, uh, diaries and other writings, letters, um, and many of these have been published. There, it's actually a whole literary genre in Japan, the last writings of the kamikaze. For some reason, these books sell like crazy, so they keep coming out. Um, so we actually do have quite a bit, even in English translation, telling us about the psychology of these pilots who were dedicated to give their lives in battle. Um, and of course, it's it's uh, we have the more recent resonance of the um, uh, su suicide attacks um, uh, across much of the Islamic world, and um, and the, you know the psychology is I, I think fascinating. Many of the kamikaze pilots, particularly in the later stages of the war during the Okinawa campaign, which was the largest cam kamikaze campaign of the war, you had um, young men who had been recruited into flight training without being told that they might be asked to give their lives. And then were pressured essentially to quote unquote volunteer. Uh, and many of them were uh, deeply reluctant and they made that clear in their writings. Um, and, uh, and indeed often they would take off from their bases in Southern Kyushu and then turn back saying they had engine problems or they weren't able to find the fleet. Um, <clears throat> from the Americans point of view, of course, the, uh, this, you know, seeing hundreds and literally hundreds and hundreds of enemy planes come in, essentially behaving like man-guided missiles, uh, was a, a unique sort of horror. So it's something that I think many of our forces never thought that they would see, found it very hard to understand. And uh, I think it contributed to the sense that uh, many of our uh, people in, on our side had that the Japanese were just fundamentally kind of different. You know, they were, this, uh, they were fanatics in a way that made it very difficult for us to understand. I think probably contributed to the context in, of the strategic bombing and ultimately the atomic bombs as well. Did I read this right uh, from Twilight of the Gods? The, the kamikaze hit Mitchell's flagship Bunker Hill, then he moved to the Enterprise and that got hit by a kamikaze. And then they hit Spruance's flagship, New Mexico, all in the same. That all area. happened in, in the space of about three days. Yeah, that's right. An yeah. Astonishing story. Yeah. yeah. Um, you write about the wartime conferences, of course, uh, Potsdam, where the Japanese were warned of prompt and utter destruction if they did not agree to unconditional surrender. Um, I, I was kind of haunted by this passage of the, the Japanese Prime Minister Suzuki's response. He, he used a Japanese word that, that can mean a lot of things. Uh, the word is mosats, apparently, and, and I'm, I'm no expert at Japanese, but it can mean a lot of things. And we interpret it in one way, but he may have meant something different by that. Is that, is that possible? Yeah. Um, it, um, <clears throat> you know, what, what was happening there was that um, the Japanese ruling circle, this tiny circle of military leaders around Hirohito, who essentially hold the nation's fate in their hands, uh, were deeply divided at this point. And part, of the, part of the Japanese uh, regime uh, it was essentially ready to recognize the necessity of surrender. You know, the Germans had been defeated. Uh, they were on the verge of, of their homeland being totally destroyed. Uh, 
And yet you had the hardliner faction uh, in the Japanese army in particular uh, that was determined to fight to the end or at least to try to fight off an invasion of the Japanese homeland before any discussion of a truce. And, um, and so the, the prime minister in that, in that case, you know, they received the Potsdam Declaration, uh, essentially demanding unconditional surrender, warning what will happen in general terms. And, uh, and the prime minister is, is trying to um, essentially sort of uh, uh, articulate a, a vague enough policy that it would satisfy both of these deadlocked elements within the regime. And so what do you do? I, I mean, we see it with politicians today. You know, if you if you can't articulate a clear policy, you try to use a vague language to you know to that might satisfy both sides. And so, really, what what he's doing is he's talking to to the hardliners in his own regime, uh, saying uh, essentially using this idiomatic term that says we're going to simply ignore this. It'll be no comment. We're not going to respond at all to the Potsdam Declaration. Mm -hmm. We're not going to reject it. We're not going to accept it. We're simply not going to. We're going to pretend it doesn't exist. And, um, and when our translators get a hold of that, we're trying to understand what it means. And, um, and essentially the, the conclusion that, uh, that our government makes is that the Japanese have rejected the Potsdam Declaration. And so it was a, it was a case in which uh, perhaps the, the, the language barrier may have contributed, not necessarily to, to a misunderstanding, but it, it contributed to the confusion that was crowded into those last weeks of the Pacific War. It's, it's just shocking to me, the need for precision in diplomatic interplay and in diplomatic communication. One has to be very careful of, of what one says. You know, you, uh, you say something very interesting uh, at, at the end, and uh, let me just say to folks out there, um, if I'm just gonna have, ask you in one or two more, and then we're gonna get to the questions because they're filling up here, and a lot of people wanna ask you stuff. You, you have a very uh, interesting analysis at the end of the book. Uh, if the Pacific War had been a game of chess, you write, there would have been no end game, by which you, you mean that, you know, when you're playing chess, it's pretty clear when one side has gotten the upper hand, no reason to play it through. If you've taken my queen, you know, well, let's just, I'll, I'll, let's just try again. I'll, I'll play again tomorrow. But of course, war, uh, you know, war isn't a chess game. I, because of this Japanese decision to fight to the beyond the bitter end, how many Japanese military personnel would U.S. make died in the last year of the war? Or so, and civilians as well, I guess. Do you have a thought on that? Yeah, um, well, you know, the, the, uh, I think the best estimates are that there were some 1.5 million Japanese servicemen and civilians who died in the last year of the war, which represents close to one half of all Japanese who died in the wars of Asia and the Pacific, beginning with the China incident in 1937. And, um, and, and so, you know, this was a, a ruinous year for the Japanese, both in terms of their fighting forces and, of course, with the strategic bombing of Japanese cities, the firebombing and the atomic bombs, um, you've got uh, something like 800,000 Japanese civilians given their lives in the last year of the war as well. And so with the chess metaphor, you know, <clears throat> it, it was so clear that uh, looking at, this, at the situation from the top levels of the Japanese government, Beginning in mid-1944, they saw this, saw the way that this was going. Uh, they, they realized that they had lost this war uh, and that uh, they were going to lose control of all of their overseas uh, resources. They were going to run out of oil. They were going to have no source of oil. Uh, they were going to um, be cut off from their armies overseas. They were going to be completely blockaded. There was going to be nothing coming into Japan, nothing going out. Uh, their economy was going to seize up, their cities were going to be burned down to the ground. They foresaw all of that. And yet uh, the conditions in Japan, political conditions in Japan, simply did not allow for any sort of concerted bid for peace. And it's a great tragedy because there were uh, elements within the Japanese leadership who foresaw that this was going to happen. And yet uh, they were unable essentially to establish the con baseline consensus that was needed to say, we've got to acknowledge that we've lost this war and I try to cut the best deal that we can. Um, and, uh, and so we had this, uh, this, you know, this horror, this horror show, which was the last year of the Pacific War.
Yes, yeah, similar. I would uh, simply add to what was going on in Europe. The last year of the war, the, the violence came to a roaring climax. And world War II did not reach a peak and then kind of just dribbled down into nothingness. It burnt itself out in a flare in both of the major, uh, both of the major theaters. Uh, Ian, on, on that note, I've got so many good questions here from our, our folks out there. And as you can imagine, if they read your books, they're a highly informed audience. So um, let's see what we uh, let's see what we can uh, take from our, our uh, our friends out there. Trent Tolenko asks a good question. Mr. Toll used a newly released diary from General Richardson, the highest ranking army officer in the Central Pacific um, in his book. How did this affect the story, uh, Ian, that you told in your book? But I, I would also ask if you could just expand, um, what other interesting sources perhaps that, that had not been touched before? I'm sure you ran across a, a, a bunch of them, but if you could address General Richardson's diary. Yeah, so General uh, Robert C. Richardson was the, uh, as the questioner says, the uh, commanding general of army forces in Nimitz's theater. So this is the north half of the Pacific, the theater commanded by Nimitz. Richardson was the army's top general in that theater. And he left a, um, a very detailed and very insightful diary, uh, which is an absolutely essential source really to understanding, particularly understanding uh, service rivalries in the Pacific, the struggle between the Army and the Navy, uh, from someone who was in direct contact with Nimitz on a virtually on a day-to-day -day basis and really knew what was happening. And so uh, Richardson's, uh, General Richardson um, uh, left his diary to his descendants and said, keep it private until the year 2015, when I'm sure that everybody I know will be gone. And, um, and I was fortunate enough to be contacted by the family uh, in 2015 and say, would you like the diary? I said, would I like this diary? <laughs> oh, oh man. Thank you so much. And um, so it's a, it's a really important new source. Um, and, uh, and it provided a, a lot of insight in many different aspects of this narrative. But most importantly, in the returning to the first chapter, the Pacific Strategy Conference when FDR visited Oahu and MacArthur flew up from Australia. MacArthur stayed with Richardson in his house in Fort Shafter on Oahu. They were old friends. And, um, and he debriefed General Richardson uh, after each of the st strategy conferences. He told him exactly what uh, he had told uh, FDR. And, um, and this is a vital new source because those, those conferences you had four guys in a room, Leahy, MacArthur, FDR, and Nimitz. Uh, there were no minutes kept, no official minutes, no staff were permitted to remain in the room. And so uh, historians have, have been forced to rely essentially on the first and second hand uh, accounts of those four participants. Uh, and MacArthur left a, a vivid account in his, in his uh, memoir published in the mid 1960s. Uh, but many of the particulars, he quotes himself at length, uh, many of the pr particulars, I think, have been called into question. And, um, and so Richardson's diaries is something that gives us essentially a, a new anchor to understand exactly what was said. Nothing quite like having someone contact you and say, would you like to see some source that no one has ever looked at before? <laughs> Makes it all worthwhile, doesn't it, Ian? Yeah. yeah, well, you know, it, it helps. It, once you publish a couple of books and people read them, then, you know, some of that kind of, some of that stuff starts coming in over the transom, to use the old naval term. It didn't happen earlier in my career. Um, but there were a number number of other, and I, I could go through, it's a long list, but there were a number of these cases where people would reach out to me and say, hey, my father left a diary. My grandfather left a, a, a series of letters, and he was serving with the Third Fleet and this and that, and you know this portion of this campaign. Would you like to look at it? I say, absolutely, I would love to look at it. Um, of course, I, as you know, I mean, there, there's no shortage of these kinds of sources available. They're in archives. The National Archives has more than any one of us could read in a lifetime. Um, and yet, when you, when you get contacted by the family to say, would you like to look at this thing that no one else has seen, you have that extra sort of special experience of, lo of looking at an important historical source that you know hasn't been used by someone else. Uh, so Fascinating. Yeah. There's a question about Peleliu. And before I ask it, it's from Woody Lee, and it's a good question about Polar's leadership on Peleliu. Let me ask you, Ian, directly, was Peleliu a mistake? I believe that uh, Peleliu, uh, well, to say that it was a mistake, I think, is, is a bit bold because, of course, the, the decision to go into Peleliu is made without the hindsight that we have today. Um, I would say, looking back from the perspective we have now, 
we should have bypassed Peleliu. We should have bypassed it and uh, not taken it. And Peleliu is an island in the Palau Island groups. It's, um, it's, it's remote even by Pacific standards. It lay near the seam between MacArthur and Nimitz's uh, two respective command areas. And, um, and it had been ordered initially as a way to essentially sort of protect MacArthur's northern flank as he returned to the Philippines. Um, as events developed, it became clear that we essentially could neutralize the airfield uh, on Peleliu and on other islands all up and down the chain. And uh, it wouldn't be necessary to take those islands, just make sure that the airfields were essentially visited routinely by our bombers, Air Force bombers and carrier bombers. Uh, and, uh, and then they wouldn't, they wouldn't be a thorn in the side of MacArthur's advance. So yes, they could have canceled that operation. It was a bloody battle, a terrible battle, a battle that uh, many Marines gave their lives fighting. And, um, and uh, looking back, it's clear that we could have bypassed uh, Peleliu without any loss of momentum in the campaign. The result, of course, was a bloodbath of epic proportions for both the, the, for the Americans and the Japanese. Uh, Woody Lee does ask a good question here. Could you comment on Puller's leadership on Peleliu, where he received some criticism for being overly aggressive and causing excessive casualties? Was he pushing too hard due to his personal aggressive nature, or was he following orders from the superiors who wanted to finish the Peleliu invasion quickly? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, uh, you know, it was both of those uh, two. It didn't have to be one or the other. You know, was, was, was he too aggressive, perhaps? Were his orders too aggressive? Yes. Essentially, um, what had happened on Peleliu, for those who are not as familiar, is <clears throat> the Japanese had very cleverly decided that they would essentially uh, develop a subterranean network of bunkers and tunnels in, uh, in the high ground on Peleliu, and essentially a, a sort of a, a network of coral hills north of the airfield. And so rather than sallying out in these bonsai charges, which had been very common in, in the earlier uh, island battles of the South Pacific, uh, they were really using um, uh, subterranean fortifications to good effect, to neutralize American advantages in air power and artillery, and naval power, uh, firepower offshore. Um, the Marine um, uh, tradition and, and uh, doctrine had been a rapid attack, take territory quickly, take losses if necessary uh, to, uh, to try to force your, your opponent back quickly. And, um, and against uh, those kinds of fortifications, those were the wrong tactics. And eventually, both the Marines and the Army, which was brought in as well, the Wildcat Division, uh, understood that what was needed there was, was more of a sort of a siege tactic approach, a gradual uh, development of, um, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, sandbag embankments. And essentially, it had to be something more akin to trench warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... You know, Chesty Puller uh, was a great Marine, and uh, that was a that was a, a a vicious battle in which he was asked to do something that any commander would have uh, failed to do, and uh, and I don't think it reflects poorly on him at all. Uh, I think it was just one of those things. It was a terrible, terrible battle, terrible uh, challenge that he was up against, and he did what he could. Mary Huron has a good question. Would I've you lost, agree? I, I lost the audio there for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Mary Huron has a good question for you. Would you agree or disagree, Ian, that Hirohito was more than a figurehead, but directly involved in the planning of the war in the Pacific? I'm referring to information in his diaries, which were released in the late 1980s. Yeah, I think that, that that's accurate. Hirohito was much more involved um, in, uh, as the commander of military forces. You know, he, was, he was against the war. Uh, he... Uh, certainly resisted the drift toward war. And, um, and the, the constitutional arrangements uh, were, were somewhat ambiguous exactly how much uh, authority did Hirohito have uh, is a disputed point even today. And yet he certainly had tremendous intangible authority uh, over his military leaders. Uh, when his military uh, leaders were unanimous in uh, recommending a course of action, he always accepted their advice. And so it really wasn't until the end of the war when they were hopelessly deadlocked. Uh, this was after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and his, uh, his inner, inner circle of, of uh, leaders, uh, um, army, navy, civilian leaders came to him and said, we need you to decide because we can't form a consensus. And it was then when he, 
intervene to say this war is over, we are surrendering. William Shepard would like to know, I have your book in hand and see that you dedicated it to Admiral Kimmel and General Short, uh, both of whom, uh, as you said, were dealt a losing hand in quotes, which must refer back to the blame made upon them for the disaster of Pearl Harbor. Please expand upon this choice, William asked. Well, Kimmel and Short, Admiral Kimmel, General Short, of course, as we all know, were uh, the commanding uh, officers on, uh, in Hawaii you know, on December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attacked. Both were relieved of command uh, and essentially spent the rest of the war answering to a series of investigations. Um, the question of uh, to what degree are they culpable uh, for the lack, clear lack of readiness, which our military forces um, uh, showed in, in being blindsided by the Japanese during that attack, you know, to what extent were they culpable? To what extent were, was our unreadiness a, uh, a, a, essentially just a, a feature of a peacetime nation that did not recognize that Japan even had the capability to attack across the distance? such distances. And to what extent were leaders in Washington culpable? Well, you know, there was a lot of culpability to go around. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so in my view... Um, Are you all right there, Ian? I have to ask. <laughs> I had a lamp fall over. Got um, it. Okay. You know, in my view, um, uh, you know, whatever you have to say about Kimball and Short and, um, and their, um, uh, their uh, command record, um, it wasn't right to, to essentially um, make them bear, an, uh, you know, a large share of, of the blame for something when, when blame really uh, should have been more fairly distributed. And so um, <clears throat> I thought, you know, this was essentially this last year of the war was when we, we um, uh, settled the score with the Japanese and that, and that you know, this this was a, the book that, that should have been dedicated to them in recognition of the fact that I think our country did them wrong. Got it. Matt Cannon uh, is on Facebook and would like to uh, know about this, uh, 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 would like to answer this question. What do either of you actually think of the theory among some historians that the Soviet invasion of Manchuria had a greater impact on the Japanese decision to surrender unconditionally rather than the two atom bombs? They argue, uh, they, being his, some historians, argue that Japanese would rather surrender to pragmatic America than the communist Soviet Union. Any any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, well, I <clears throat> I would agree with the last part of that. Um, so uh, just the timeline, we you know we hit uh, Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. We hit Nagasaki on August 9th. The uh, Soviet Union suddenly declared war on Japan, surprising Japan, uh, on also on August 9th. And, uh, and essentially you had the Red Army charge into Manchuria, one of the largest ground attacks in the history of war. And, um, and this was a tremendous blow to the Japanese, not only because of the immediate military emergency that it created, but also because they're, they're really their sole remaining kind of hope of a diplomatic exit to the war was to, uh, to bring Stalin, ask Stalin to, to, to act as a mediator uh, in, in arranging truce talks. Uh, between the, the Americans and the Japanese. And so the, the declaration of war there essentially extinguished that last hope of a diplomatic exit to the war. So the question is, what was the relative importance of the atomic bombs and the sudden, the sudden Russian attack in uh, prompting the Japanese surrender? Well, historians have debated this. Um, and I think it's difficult to, to say precisely what the relative importance of these things were because the timetable was so compressed it was clear that they were both really important. Uh, the shocks coming together uh, in a short period of time were important. Um, in my view, is it, it's really impossible to say which was more important. They were, both were very important together in combination, they were important. Uh, but of course, as Americans, we, we have tended to uh, really see the end of the Pacific War as two mushroom clouds. You know, the atomic bombs loom so large in our understanding of how the war ended that we have often forgotten uh, this, uh, I think, probably equally important factor that the Russians suddenly declared war on the Japanese and um, uh, extinguished that last hope of a sort of a diplomatic exit to the war. 
I think, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our hour right now together. And it, as always, when the conversation is so brilliant, Ian, it, it flew by. Uh, the author is Ian W. Toll, uh, and the book is Twilight of the Gods, War in the Western Pacific, 1944-1945. Probably don't have to tell this audience that. It's the third book in the trilogy. So if, you're, if you've come this far, you, you must read the, uh, the, the final and third volume. Ian, I'd like to thank you for spending this hour with us. Uh, we have to get you back down here to New Orleans when conditions, uh, re normal conditions reassert themselves. Although normal conditions, very relative concept here in New Orleans. <laughs> I look forward to it, Rob. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And uh, good night to everyone uh, from the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Dr. Rob Satino here. Have a great night.